Well, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce to you Sister Simone Campbell. She is the executive director of Network. She's an attorney, she's a poet, and she's the coordinator of Nuns on the Bus, which I'm sure some of you have heard about. She is a Catholic leader in the global movement for justice and peace, educating and organizing and lobbying for economic and social transformation. I work on climate change, energy and climate change. Between us, we are taking a moral stance on these issues. And what was, what was great fun for both of us, although Sister Simone and I didn't discuss it earlier while we discussed many things, Pope Francis came to the United States two weeks ago and took our messages and amplified them in a really, really big way. So we now have the Pope on our side. <laughs> and, I, and Sister Simone doesn't know this, and I hope you're listening. Two weeks ago, when the Pope was in America, I was invited to go back to Washington and be on the White House lawn when he arrived. Well, she was there too, and I didn't see her, but one of my assignments while I was in D.C. was to be on Chris Matthews' program called Hardball. And I was going to be talking about climate and how the Pope's message resonated with what we've been saying for the last 15 years, and I was going to be on with Sister Simone Campbell, two of us. About an hour before, I was scheduled to be picked up in the really fancy black car that, um, that uh, Chris Matthews picks his guests up in. I got a telephone call in my hotel room that said I was disinvited from, from Chris Matthews' hardball because Chris had decided early in the day when he saw Pope Francis and all of his cardinals and essentially all men surrounding him, that he really wanted to have this program dedicated to women in the clergy. Well, I stood my ground and said, wait, I'm a woman in the clergy. I can talk about um, how, what it's like to be a woman ordained. And, and <laughs> but I lost out, and he replaced me with someone else. Sister Simone can tell you who that was. But they went on the show and they talked about women in the Catholic Church. And I stayed in my hotel room and watched the show. <laughs> it, it, however, it was a great, amazing, and wonderful experience to be in Washington at that time with the Pope. And to have Sister Simone here with you today and talking about, which I'm sure she'll bring to your attention, that climate change, environmental justice, economic justice, all of these things are moral issues. They're about who are we as a people, and as the Pope says, we have to all come together, put aside our differences, and work to save this common home that we all share. I bring you Sister Simone Campbell. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Good morning. What a treat to be here. Um, I'm a Californian, I'm a native Californian, and when my plane landed from DC, where I currently live in San Francisco, I breathed a sigh of relief saying, oh, I'm home. And being here with you who care passionately, personally, about the issues that are affecting our planet, our nation, our communities, is a joy to my heart. I want to take this time, I don't have a fancy uh, uh, PowerPoint the way um, our, uh, Hank did. I mean, that was amazing, wasn't it? But uh, what I bring is merely stories. Because what he said was that it's about the head, but it's also about the heart. And what I have learned is having advocated in DC for over 11 years now, I have used every rational approach. I'm a lawyer, I'll make my arguments, and I've hit stone walls. It's like, oh, 
Climate change doesn't exist. Oh, who cares? That's oh, nice, but unencumbered by data, they will say most anything. And what I have, <laughs> what I have realized is, what I have realized is, is back in the 80s, the story of our nation began to change. And President Reagan is at the heart of that change, where he said, we're all about the individual. We are about the one who rode off on the horse into the West and settled the West, as if that was done by one man. And as a woman, I will say it was a man. That's not a gender generic statement. The man rode off and settled the West. But what we know is, it's an unpatriotic lie to say we're based in individualism. The fact is, we're based in community. Because the fact is that it was not one wagon heading west. It was not, I mean, if you yelled, circle the wagons to your one wagon, you kind of had trouble. <laughs> it was also the fact that if you did a barn raising and only one person showed up, a little difficult. And if you had a quilting bee, now I tried this, I tried making a quilt, and five years into the project I decided maybe I needed to invite my friends over to help me get this blessed thing done. <laughs> our nation and our world is based in community, and we have lost sight of that story. And what I have learned from my, I, I heard from the applause that some of you have heard about our Nuns on the Bus project, which is driving around the country, meeting communities, hearing stories. And what I have learned is what builds community is when we let our hearts be broken open by hearing the stories. It is, it is risking the pain of a broken heart not the organization of the cere cerebellum that makes it all organized. That's a defense against making progress. Because as long as it's just here in my head, I'm in control, I can take care of it, don't worry, I don't need anybody else. But when my heart's broken, open, I know I need everyone. And that is a big part of our movement, to let our hearts be broken open. We just did a bus trip in advance of Pope Francis coming to the U.S. And in, uh, we started in St. Louis, and our whole theme was bridge the divides, transform politics. Because what I believe is that unless we find a way to come together in the urgency of a broken heart, we're, never, we're only continuing our polarized, separate realities. And I had realized in the image of bridging divides is that you start making a bridge by sinking pillars way down deep. I love the Golden Gate for that reason. You, you sink, those pillars go way down deep and you think when you see just the pillars, how are they ever gonna get it together? But what happens is over time, you can build out and meet in the middle. We started in the shadow of the arch in Kansas City in front of the courthouse where the Dred Scott decision was made. And remember, that decision was the one that solidified racism, uh, racism in our nation by affirming slavery. It was in the shadow of the anguish of our past, but this gateway to the west of our future that we started our bus trip. It was at that very opening that I heard from moms. There are these two moms that have gone together. They live in an area just outside St. Louis where there's a Superfund cleanup site. It's left over from World War II creation of the atomic bomb. Now, a bunch of us have feelings about the atomic bomb, but we won't go there on this talk. Bring me back sometime, we'll talk about that issue. But what the moms told me, these two moms told me, is their kids have developed brain tumors because there are um, or, uh, radioactive waste that was just covered up it, after World War II. Now, that's longer ago than I've been alive, and you would think we would figure out how to clean it up. But currently, there's a huge fight about who's supposed to clean it up. And, uh, I mean, that's a bunch of years that's been going on. 
And now there is an underground fire that has started that is moving towards the Missouri River. Now we just heard about the importance of water. You would think our people would wake up, don't you? That maybe we ought to pay a little bit attention. But the economic powers are such that they're worried about the cost. When these two moms are worried because both of their kids have been diagnosed with brain tumors that are the result of the toxicity in the area. And they told me that there is over a 300% increase in brain tumors in young kids. How in God's green earth can we continue to destroy our planet and worry about the money involved in a cleanup when our children are dying? This is wrong. And these, these brave moms, these brave moms who worry about their kids and chemo and surgery and things that just sounded so horrible and these kids who are losing their childhood because they spend most of their time in the hospital getting chemo or radiation, these kids, these moms broke my heart. I cannot stay silent when my heart is broken because I have opportunities. We all have opportunities to share their story and say, come on, we're better than this. Our nation is better than this. Our world is better than this. From that heartbreaking experience, we went to speak to Mothers to Mothers. Mothers to Mothers is a new organization that was started after the Ferguson unrest. Remember the Ferguson event in August of 2014? Michael Brown, an African-American man, not doing anything, unarmed, was killed by a white police officer. Mystery remains. These moms came together in St. Louis, brought together by Reverend Tracy Blackman, and she said, they said together, we've got to do something, much like we're saying today here. And these moms came up with the idea that maybe if they went to talk to white moms about what black moms have to worry about, it, that white moms don't have to worry about, maybe the toxicity of racism could be alleviated. The toxicity of what we're doing to our planet and the toxicity of racism have the same roots have the same roots of exploitation, of arrogance, of thinking, oh, it's just about me and mine. That's wrong. What these moms told me, it, it, I mean, I'll never forget Marlo. Marlo's a, a big, tall, wonderful, gorgeous African-American woman with this shocking white hair. It's just beautiful, and she's a grandma. And her little son, her grandson, Chico, Chico, you could rub his head and pat him on the shoulder, and he was just this cute little kid. And she told us that, Within about an eight month period, Chico went from being four foot something where you could pat him on the head to over six feet. But what she said that terrifies her is still inside of Chico. He feels like the four foot eight little kid. He has no idea of how other people see him because of the toxicity of racism. His walking threatens some people. And I realized I walk in white skin and I don't even have to worry about that. I don't have to worry that I might be intimidating. I, as a woman, I am less intimidating than just some tall, big men. And I realized I have a responsibility to let my heart be broken open by Chico and Marlo's story and say, enough, enough. Amy. <laughs> Amy who teaches in a university, and she has a PhD, fancy letters after her name, I forget all of them, and she said she's got two boys, an eighth grader and a 10th grader. The eighth grader, uh, and, she, and she drills them regularly on what to do when they're stopped by the police, not if, when. And she says, you keep your hands out of your pockets, you keep your arms away from your body, you don't get any teenage attitude and you say, yes, sir, no, sir. <sighs> Can you imagine teenagers not getting teenage attitude if they're stopped by the police? Well, she's terrified. She's terrified. I'm trying to teach them humility, she says. And then her eighth grader said to her the week before we came, mommy. And when she said mommy, I, that somehow broke my heart. 
Mommy, how long is this going to go on? And she had to look him in the eye and say, the rest of your life, the rest of your life. Well, I'm here to tell you, my heart has been broken open by the stories of the women whose children have brain cancer, Marlo and her grandson Chico, Amy and her two boys, and I am convinced we cannot say this is going to go on for the rest of your life. We have got to give Amy a different message. So what do we do? How in God's green earth do we do it? We've been working hard on this, haven't we? We've been trying, we've been picketing, we've been getting petitions out there, we've been doing protests, we've been doing just about everything we can think of. At least I have, and I'm sure you have too, because you're here, and that was one of the things you could think of. Well, I, I've got this idea, I've got this idea that while I come at this from faith, I, I, I really think faith helps make missionaries, but um, I, I'm gonna advocate a more uh, secular missionary activity. Because what I've learned in my, our bus trips around the country is that often folks are frightened, overwhelmed. They see statistics like we just saw in that amazing PowerPoint presentation, and they feel like, ugh, I'm just trying to survive. Pull up the drawbridge, don't bother me. You ever encounter that? Yeah. Uh, once or twice, yes, once or twice. Well, here's the challenge. As long as we perpetuate this idea of individualism, as long as we perpetuate the idea it's just about me and mine and taking care of my family, as long as we perpetuate this idea that the community doesn't matter, then we can have people pulling up the drawbridge and stopping. But we have to tell the truth. And the truth is, it's way more complex than any of our politicians want to tell us. It's way more complex even than we want to admit. Because, you know, I'll tell you, it's really nice to think it is about individualism because then I have power and I can make change. But it's not possible. I have learned that change is only possible if we're all in it together. If we build bridges across the divides, if we go and share heartbreaking stories, stories that touch our heart, folks we care about, share the story, and then say, how can we work together? How can we be in this together? What difference can we make? And so I'm advocating three virtues. Catholic sister ought to advocate virtue. So my three virtues for the 21st century are these. The first is holy curiosity. Holy curiosity that gets you to talk to people you wouldn't talk to otherwise, even folks like my brother Jim, who drives me nuts, um, who can answer the question, what are you caring about? How do you think about what's happening in our world? And often my questions are more likely to be about the toxicity of racism or the toxicity of a Superfund site or the toxicity of income inequality. And I won't call it that. That scares people. It sounds a little huge. So I'll say, hmm, have you thought about our drought that California's been in? Are you worried about that? What do you think? Do you think there's something we can do about it? So if you ask those kinds of questions, just standing in the line in the grocery store, that's where I do it, Grocery store missionary work. And maybe, it, but if we're curious, if we're curious about others, then we get to create community in that moment. And what I've found out is people have thought about this stuff, but they never talk about it. Rather talk about you know, 49ers or um, the Raiders or whoever your team is. Drives me nuts. But, <laughs> though I am a 49ers fan, I will confess. But the, the challenge is we need to initiate conversation about things that matter. Occasionally, you get somebody that looks at you like you're nuts, but so what? I am a little nuts. It's all right. But if people are hungry for these conversations I've experienced. So the first virtue is holy curiosity. The second virtue follows on holy curiosity. 
and that is sacred gossip. <laughs> sacred gossip where you share what you've heard. So I, uh, the other night I was out at a diner over in Walnut Creek and uh, my holy curiosity leads me to ask waitstaff, are you making a living wage? Or, or are you re relying just on tips? I now have sacred gossip required that I let people know. They're making a living wage. They chose a really great place to go. You should support it over in Poets Corner, wherever that was, in Walnut Creek area. But, it, but you share what you hear. Or I was in the grocery store and found out that somebody thinks the, what, the way to solve the problem of wages is do away with minimum wage. That I didn't get, but that was true. That's how some people think. But if we share the truth about what we find out, then we can begin to create connections. And then finally, the third virtue is in reflection, in the quiet of listening to your inside self, Figure out what your one passion is, your one mission, your one piece of what to do. Because it's from that place of reflection, of weeping for the broken heart, of knowing that if your heart's been broken open, you're going to be called forward. Because too often, those of us that care about all this stuff get overwhelmed. And so we end up just sitting in front of our computers thinking, bleh. It's too much. The stack of responses of uh, donate to us, please, in the mail. The, I mean, more trees have died for that process. And, and then the petitions to sign on online, and you just think, Ugh. The challenge is for us, who care, is to know our one piece. And in my faith tradition and in my, and most faith traditions, we come to realize we are one body. We're in this together. And if we're in this together, then that means if we each do our part, it all gets done. Now, the image of being one body is very, some of you come from a Christian tradition, I'm sure, and you may remember that St. Paul in an epistle, a letter he wrote, said that we're all one body, but we're not all ears, and we're not all hands, not all eyes. And so I tried to reflect on, well, what is my role in this body? Well, I think I'm stomach acid in the body. <laughs> because my job, my, I can't do service now. I can't do all, your, all, all of the demonstrations. I go around talking, stirring people up. It's like stomach acid, releasing energy into the environment. But, <laughs> but what's your job? What's your job? Because I need you to do your part. Because if you do your part and I do mine, we can change this reality. We can let Amy's son know this won't go on forever. We can end the toxicity to our planet and the toxicity of racism and the toxicity of economic disparity. We can make a difference, but it's in making that difference that we have to do it together. Because no one of us is in control. No one of us can do it alone. And so to close this out, I want to end with one of my poems because I think it's the part that we often miss. It's that quiet part where we get moved beyond where we would be otherwise. And so I want to advocate for you to take a bit of quiet to see what bubbles up for where you're called. Because if you do your part, I'll continue to be stomach acid for as long as I'm needed. <laughs> We can change this reality and tell Amy's son it's not going to go on forever. And the poem goes like this. It's called Living Waters. It's perfect after it follows all the dreadful water stuff we had. It goes, Living Waters. Impetuous me favors the passionate tumult of spring river flooding. Sensuous me favors the indolent caress of summer river flowing. Reflective me favors the penetrating seep of autumn river trickling. Even aloof shy me favors the chilled reserve of winter river freezing. But all of me resists evaporation. <laughs> I resist the sucking, pulling, warm air resting me from known boundaries. I resist drifting unseen to unknown parts. 
I resist the uncertainty of unformed floating, yearning rather to surround rocks and carve new paths. I resist the ambiguous, foggy drift. But luckily, at times, I am yanked into air there, beholding Earth's anguish weep. Weeping, raining, puddling, perhaps the beginning of an exuberant spring. Thank you so much. <laughs>